Hello YouTube, this is MK Vine once again, and this is a video response to Ozzy's response of my video on was Jesus even the perfect sacrifice. I do want to thank Ozzy for responding to my video. I think he brought up some very good points, and I did take them into consideration. Now moving on to my video, firstly I would like to point out that you did not deal with Isaiah 53, which deals with the death of a righteous servant being made in Asham. And Asham is a guilt offering. If you recall from the Tanakh, guilt offerings are mentioned in places like Leviticus and elsewhere in the Tanakh as a sacrifice in which the sacrificial laws apply. According to your logic, the servant in Isaiah 53 would have to have his blood spilled on the altar if he were to be a guilt offering. Of course, the text itself does not say that, that this person is to die according to sacrificial laws. In fact, I mentioned in my video that Jews often apply this verse to the suffering of the nation of Israel and even to the Holocaust itself. I will briefly quote from respected Orthodox Jewish historian Rabbi, Rabbi Beryl Wayne and what he says regarding the Holocaust. He says, quote, Jews nurtured this classic idea of death as an atonement and this attitude towards um, their own tragedies was their constant companion throughout their turbulent exile. Therefore, the holy bleak picture of unreasoning slaughter was somewhat relieved by the fact that the innocent did not die in vain and that the betterment of Israel and humankind somehow was advanced by their stretching their neck to be slaughtered." Unquote. So this is from the book Yevin Metsula, the end of chapter 15. Of course, no one would agree that the Jews who died in the Holocaust, or anywhere else for that matter, had their sacrificial laws applied to them. Um, Yet, in Isaiah 53, it says that their death served as a nasham, a guilt offering, and guilt offerings are supposed to be offered up according to sacrificial laws. So, I'm just seeing an inconsistency here in your reasoning. The death and suffering of the nation of Israel only typified that of the sacrificial laws without having those laws actually apply, apply to them. For Christians who believe that Isaiah 53 applies to Jesus, the same thing applies here. Jesus only typified that sacrifice without having the laws applied to him. I would also like to point out that Zia Ahmed is the one who made a straw man argument. He points out that the sacrifice of Christ is to be literally equated with the, sac uh, with the sacrificial laws. However, like I mentioned before, Jesus was not a literal lamb. The phrase, the Lamb of God, is only symbolic and typified or prefigured his death with the, with the, sacrificial, with the sacrifice of the lamb. Since he is not a literal lamb, the Messiah only pointed to the animal's blood, which typified the sacrifice pre prescribed in the Torah. In fact, this is what the Catechism says on this, quote, By doing so, he reveals that Jesus is, the same t at, is at the same time the suffering servant who silently allows himself to be led to the slaughter and who bears the sin of the multitudes, and also the Paschal Lamb, the symbol of Israel's redemption at the first Passover. And let me repeat, the Paschal Lamb, the symbol of Israel's redemption at the first Passover. And this is, unquote, and this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 608. So here we see that the Messiah's death was only a symbol of the Passover Lamb, which is again mentioned in Exodus 12. And this is why John the Baptist called the Messiah the Lamb of God. Also, St. Paul links the Messiah to the Passover Lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And this is just to show that the Messiah only typified the sacrifice. In fact, the sacrifice of Isaac also typified the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Yet, those sacrificial laws did not apply to him. In the Midrash Mechilta of Rabbi Ishmael, it says, quote, And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And I see the blood of the binding of Isaac, unquote. And let me repeat, I see the blood of the binding of Isaac. So according to this text, God wasn't looking at the blood of the lamb. He was looking at the blood of Isaac. Now if you now you may point out that Isaac was not actually sacrificed, but the rabbis taught that his willingness to be sacrificed served as is as if he had actually been sacrificed. The Midrash Hagadol on Genesis 22:19 says, quote, Scripture credits Isaac with having died and his ashes being laid upon the altar. Unquote. And also Sifra 102 in the Babylonian Talmud, the Anit 16a, say pretty much the same thing. In fact, some Jewish inter uh, traditions actually say that Isaac did spill some of his blood. 
um, quote, the Holy One, blessed be he, says to Moses, I will keep faith to pay the reward of I Isaac, son of Abraham, who gave one fourth of his blood on the altar, unquote. And this is from the Mechilta de Rashbi, page 4, and the Tanhuma Vayera, section 23. You said that Hebrews 10 directly links the death of Jesus with the sacrificial lamb. Yes, this is true. But as I mentioned in my other video, the death of Maryam, Nadab, and Abihu also directly links their death with animal sacrifices. And yet, the sacrificial laws did not apply to them. And this is to show that just as the death of the Messiah uh, is being prefigured, so also the death of the, those righteous people that I mentioned is also being prefigured. In regards to the death of Miriam, I did mention that her death was in conjunction or a direct link with the sacrifice of the red heifer, and yet she died in the desert and was not offered up in the temple. So again, this just shows that her death prefigured that of the red heifer with respect to having atoning power. The whole point of my video is to show how someone's death can have the same atoning power as an animal sacrifice without having those laws applied to them. You said that Rambam doesn't mention anything about the death of the righteous. The thing is, I did show you where Rashi mentions the death of the righteous, and Rambam doesn't say otherwise, so you can't argue from silence. And not only that, in addition to Rashi, I also mentioned the Babylonian Talmud, Moed Katan 28a. If you want more sources, rabbinic scholar Solomon uh, Schletzter also says the same thing in his book, Aspects of Rabbinic Theology, pages 310 to 311. And he also quotes the um, the Talmud I just mentioned on that. In regards to Nadab and Abihu, it mentions their death as a direct link to the Day of Atonement, and yet the, sac the sacrificial laws of the Day of Atonement did not apply to them. Again, this is saying that their death pre um, prefigured the Day of Atonement, in the same way that the Messiah's death only prefigured or typified those of the sacrificial lamb. So I think Zia Ahmed's video was a successful, successful straw man because his whole video dealt with how the Messiah was a literal animal sacrifice. But I have just shown that just because there's a direct link to animal, animal sacrifice, it does not mean that those laws have to apply to righteous people. Again, I encourage you to look at the death of Maryam, Nadab, Abihu, and Abihu, and also of Isaac and Isaiah 53 for examples. Then you go on to say that the... Levites did not provide literal atonement, but the text itself says otherwise. Let me quote verse 19 of Numbers 8. Quote, Of all the Israelites, I have given the Levites as gifts to Aaron and his sons to do the work of the tent of meeting on behalf of the Israelites and to make atonement, let me repeat, and to make atonement for them so that no plague will strike the Israelites when they go near the sanctuary. And also Jacob Milgram one of the foremost experts on the biblical system of atonement disagrees with you. He says, quote, Our text, Numbers 8.19, would then imply that the Levites are ransom for Israel, a lightning rod to attract God's wrath upon themselves whenever an Israelite encroach among the holy place, unquote. And this is from his book, Numbers, page 371. In regards to 4th Maccabees, perhaps I wasn't clear on this, but I never said that um, this was a book in the Tanakh or that it was a canonical book. I said it was a historical Jewish book. I was just merely pointing out that this view is recorded in Jewish history. In fact, this book mentions the victory of over the Greeks, and the Jews celebrate this victory on Hanukkah. You mentioned that 2 Samuel that for 2 Samuel the death did not appease the wrath of the Gibeonites. However, if you look at the context of this chapter, Samuel had killed many of the Gibeonites, and in verse 3, King David asked the Gibeonites, how can he make amends or atonement for their death? Verse, then, uh, verse 6 answers this, the Gibeonites asked to kill seven male descendants. In Rashi's commentary, um, it is in the context of appeasement. If you look at verse 2 and verse 4 of his commentary, King David was trying to appease the Gibeonites. So his the whole context of, is of appeasement in regards to the burial of the bodies. I said that this was in regards to answering prayer on behalf of the Lamb. I didn't say that this made appeasement. You said that your commentary on the stone edition said that the rain itself provided atonement. 
fine, I will give you that. But in Rashi's commentary, he tied the rain with the practices of burial rites. Either way, in Judaism, the way to provide atonement is through animal sacrifice. And yet no animal sacrifice is recorded here. This is just to show that or that atonement can be prefigured and typified. Uh, finally, Christians are not the only ones who say that the death of the Messiah atones for sins. Um, I will actually end my video with a quote from the Zohar. So thank you everyone for watching.